Boy. So what does community mean to you and how does this impact community? You no, know, community means a sense of shared interest and sometimes being in it together. Somehow your fates are intertwined in a way. The narrower you get, the more it has to do with a sense of identity and affiliation. You're intertwined in some kind of common project. I've been to 11 countries in my research, in Washington, in one place, and I touch down it. People like us, people who are in the policy area, in politics or in think tanks, the responsibility we have is immense. We are affecting real people's lives and sometimes spoiling them. If we find a fact that doesn't correspond with, uh, with our theories, we should change them. The lives of these people is more important than our pride. Our lives from the moment born in a government hospital uh, and then through compulsory government primary schooling, compulsory uh, next stage of schooling, secondary schooling, all this, uh, the benefits you may get for getting a, uh, a subsidized uh, apartment, uh, and around the world, I contend that the welfare states of the world have done a considerable amount of harm. Here's, here's what I think should be done in welfare states. I think health savings accounts should be compulsory. I think there should be no welfare benefits, almost of any kind, unless there is what the Germans call health and hassle. That's to say, you should be helped into work and you should be hassled into work. Uh, and things like food stamps, disability benefits, they should all be subject to this health and hassle. I think that in uh, care for the elderly, care for children, we should minimize the subsidy of what I would provocatively call stranger care. At the moment, in many countries, you will get extra money as long as somebody who's not related to the person concerned looks after the child or the elderly person. Now, this is damaging, it breaks up families. You should give up on public housing. Public housing hasn't worked across the world. And anybody's interested in this book, uh, The Welfare of Nations, uh, it'll be a sale outside there uh, afterwards, and I'm sure you can even be persuaded to maybe sign your copy. I actually have to welcome back, uh, so to speak, Will Wilkinson. Uh, now he's uh, with the Scannon Center, where he's the Vice President for Policy, and is helping to develop some of their, uh, their broader ideas. On uh, he's also a columnist for Vox, uh, which is maybe the first that we've had here in Kingdom. Uh, at any rate, we're thrilled to have him here, and uh, so I'm going to turn it over to, to Will. Thanks for having me. Uh, it is uh, a real pleasure and honor uh, to be back here at the Cato Institute. Uh, James Bartholomew's book, The Welfare of Nations, uh, was a genuine pleasure to read. It is a richly detailed uh, comparative analysis of the ins and outs of social policy in a handful of advanced countries. And it, and it really is a, uh, you know, a compendium of information out of it, and an immense amount about the uh, actual uh, structure of different government systems in a number of countries uh, that I didn't know about. And so it's an incredibly uh, useful resource of information about how different welfare states work. And it's written with a, an incredibly engaging, charming, first person man of the streets, the journalistic flair. For such a wonky book, it is very beautiful. But it did defy my expectations. Uh, when I received the book, I was actually expecting something else. I was expecting uh, more of a focused critique of the welfare state. Its scope was a lot broader. So when I think of the welfare state, you know, there's a kind of core set of programs that are welfare programs, and those are kind of like the public assistance, anti-poverty programs, like CANF and SNAP, and, then, and maybe old aid pensions, like Social Security. This book covers a huge amount of territory. All of those things that I mentioned, those sort of core welfare state programs, uh, are covered in detail. Um, but we also get chapters on the minimum wage, on education systems, on uh, family formation, on the very broad effects that the welfare programs are uh, alleged to have on you know, moral character and behavior, occupational licensing, which is the general matter of public sector employment, and we even get a critique of the very idea of representative democracy. Um, for Bartholomew, the welfare state is a comprehensive regime type. He presents it as a kind of middle ground between like laissez-faire classical liberalism and something like socialism. But the main question of the book to me was never precisely 
clear Bartholomew's overarching rhetoric, which is very, very hostile to the welfare state, suggests that the question is sort of like whether we ought to have a welfare state. Yet the welfare state is never compared to anything else. The book doesn't really ask whether we ought to have a welfare state, even though it seems like it wants to ask whether we want to have a welfare state. It ends up being mainly concerned with the question of what kind of welfare state uh, should we have, which is the question we ought to be asked. Um, in the end, Bartholomew endorses the welfare state, a very minimal one, but conceding that that's likely to be politically feasible in democracies, settles on a set of recommendations for making welfare states better. And all these recommendations, I've got quibbles with lots of individual recommendations, but on the whole, they're very, very, very good and very, very helpful. The book would have felt a little more coherent and powerful to me. Its recommendations would have come across with more force if it had acknowledged that modern welfare states are just incredibly successful. They absolutely do deliver the goods that they promise. Welfare. People have never been better off than they are today in modern welfare states. People live longer, they're better educated, they're wealthier, they're healthier. Welfare or well-being is exceedingly high in welfare states. It's never been higher than at any point in the entire history of humankind. So Bartholomew relentlessly attacks pathologies of the welfare state because of employment, they break down families, they break down society's moral fabric. Uh, he even argues, to me, very unpersuasively that welfare states cause crime. But in social science and public policy, you've always got to ask uh, about any criticism compared to what? What are we comparing whatever these pathologies are supposed to be to? My big problem, the overarching 60,000 foot problem, is that uh, Bartholomew never really confronts the macro level edit, uh, evidence that welfare states are just simply tremendous. So, like, here's the OECD ranking of public spending as a percentage of GDP, which uh, you can use as a rough measure of the scope of a country's welfare state. But then you've got Finland, it's got the second biggest welfare state in the world, it's the ninth freest country in the world, according to the Cato Institute Human Freedom Index. It's the fifth happiest country in the world, according to the World Happiness Report, and has the best education system in the world, as measured by student test scores. That sounds like it's delivering welfare. It sounds like it's very successful. So this isn't coming at the cost of freedom, as the Cato Institute measures. So if welfare states have such bad effects, why don't those effects show up in these indicators? Bartholomew marshals uh, an incredible amount of evidence uh, to support his contention that welfare states have bad effects, but he never considers whether welfare states also have positive effects. That said, I want to just repeat that it's an incredibly rich source of information um, and that the actual positive, practical recommendations that Bartholomew offers are on the whole um, excellent and I hope people pay attention to them. But again, my worry is that they won't because of the framing in which the recommendations are put, which is uh, just an overarching hostility to the welfare state as such. Thanks. Uh, the last comment here uh, is going to be from Sven Larsen, <laughs> who is an economist who specializes in macroeconomics and the welfare state. His book, Industrial Poverty, which I think does a terrific job of debunking a lot of myths around the, the welfare states. It, it is a very good book. Um, I guess I'll have to start out with saying I disagree with both Will and with James here. Um, uh, the welfare state can be rolled back, and it should be rolled back for a host of reasons. I think it's a compelling book, it's a great piece of, of research, especially because uh, a good part of the book is spent on taking the welfare state down to the street level. I find it hard sometimes to explain to uh, legislators, and also to the general public, exactly how the welfare state corrupts a culture, and corrupts a society. If you really want to know how the welfare state gets under the skin of people, if I put it that way, then James's book is, is a fantastic contribution. I think the issue of the welfare state that James brings up and, and Will comments extensively on is, um, is it so entrenched, solidly built into our society that we just can't get rid of it? To some degree, yes, it is. The reason why it has become so entrenched is that the modern welfare state, the, the, the ones that we see around the world in James and sport, is built on the principle of egalitarianism. The modus operandi of the welfare state today is not to do away with poverty. It is not to uh, uh, even alleviate poverty, uh, if you want to be a little more 
It is to redistribute income and other economic resources. Because when people start getting things for free and have no incentive to move up toward uh, full self-sufficiency, they will stay there. As the population that receives entitlements from the welfare state grows, such as the example that, that James took from Rome, then of course you're going to see uh, more and more popular support for the welfare state. But I am willing to concede the point that yes, the welfare state gets, expands rapidly, sets deep roots, and it's difficult to get rid of. But it is not impossible if you point to the actual um, philosophical and economic problems and, and address those. When it comes to the philosophical side, I would say you don't need to do uh, all the reforms that um, uh, James points to. What you need is a constitutional amendment here in the United States that bans the use of tax money for, for economic redistribution purposes. That would be the end of the welfare state. When it comes to the economic side, um, I fundamentally disagree with Will. He, he gives a lot of accounts of how the welfare state is doing well. Uh, if you look at um, all macroeconomic indicators that matter, uh, GDP growth, personal income, self-sufficiency, if you will, the welfare states are doing absolutely poorly. The European economy has barely uh, exceeded 1% uh, GDP growth in almost 10 years now. The uh, US economy uh, has had a very hard time growing faster than 3% for the past 16, 17 years. The growth spurt under Bill Clinton's presidency was an anomaly. We've seen a decline in growth here in the US, which correlates perfectly with the expansion of the welfare state. We look at how uh, important personal co current transfers are to our personal income. In other words, how large a share of the money that people spend every month do they get from government? Uh, in 1965, it was 6% on average. In 1975, 10 years after the, the launch of the war on poverty, it was 12%. Today, it's uh, over 17%. If you correlate that with GDP growth and with growth in personal income, you see that the more people depend on government, the more uh, we will also drift into a, a state of macroeconomic stagnation. But if you look at other indicators, people can't get ahead. You can't build a life in these countries. If you look at, for example, the, the stock market industrial index in those countries that uh, Will mentioned, they all consist of a few large companies that have been around for, for almost ever. We, we should not be seduced into going into these uh, more intangible measurements talk about the welfare state. What, what matters at the end of the day is, will your children have a better life than you? That comes down to, will they be able to buy a house? Will they be able to support themselves? Will they be able to raise their kids without depending on government? Will they be able to save for their own retirement? And if you look at these hard macroeconomic numbers and, and measurements, then the welfare state is a big fat uh, um, cost to us and it, in fact I am increasingly worried that that is what is going to be the demise of Western civilization one day. I do believe that we can end the welfare state, I mean, uh, not only can we but we have to and I think the, the knowledge that James has accumulated and reports in this book is a big step toward educating people about why we need to do that. So I really like the first part of both their speeches. Yeah, the compliments. <laughs> that was great. It's very flattering to have, even people having telling you what rubbish your book is, it means they care. You know, it's really I'm very honest. As to this, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Sven says, but I obviously don't agree with some of what Will said, apart from the compliments. Um, the, 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 I mean, yes, it doesn't make the argument that there's a counterfactual. It doesn't say, uh, here's this country which doesn't have a welfare state, it's done much better, people are much happier. Because there aren't, I can't do that. I mean, I cannot get hold of a country that doesn't have a welfare state, because they all do. The closest I've been able to get to it is in my previous book, where I look at how um, Britain has changed, and how systems were existing and growing. Uh, for example, in 1856, they did a government survey before there was any government education found that 95% of children were got about six years of education between the ages of, ages of about uh, 8 and uh, 6 and 14 or something like that. 
So they found that it was already, as the words of the specialist in this area says, they jumped on a galloping horse. And the ability of uh, society to provide solutions in mutual help, in family help, in charity, is gigantic. And that was demonstrated, if you want to read it in my previous book, The Welfare State Bridge, it's there. If you want to see the power of mutual help, then look back to the history of Britain, and perhaps to some extent America as well, and also the church. There are all sorts of ways in which people found a way to look after themselves without compromising the, the growth, without creating low taxes. So, I mean, I, I didn't make a counterfactual, but there are reasons why I didn't make a counterfactual. You had people who had chosen by going to the polls to become or remain stakeholders in a welfare state. Now, there may be uh, uh, philosopher kings who may design dis capable of designing and administering an alternative, but essentially to do this is to abandon democracy. So don't people, individual voters, who are stakeholders in welfare states, have, have the liberty and ought to have the liberty to continue to be its stakeholders? Uh, anybody want to know? Yes, obviously. People have the right to shoot themselves and uh, do terrible things to themselves. I mean, that's, I, I believe in democracy. If people want to ruin their lives and those of their compatriots, then that's fine. But, you know, I, yeah, the purpose of advocacy is to try and persuade people not to, not to go so, you know, make reforms which will make their lives better and avoid uh, reforms which will make things worse. I mean, that, but of course, ultimately, they have a decision. But what I would say is the form of democracy does demonstrate the, the best welfare state in a democratic country is probably that of Switzerland, and that is the one that is most democratic. I don't want to give up democracy, but I think democracy of a better sort doesn't end up with people who do grandiose plans, not what they were elected to do, and, and people who are more irresponsible voting for a representative than they are on an individual issue. We in Britain are particularly aware of this after leaving the European Union. Now, I would also note that one of the things that we do in this country is we put limits on democracy because there's a limit to how far you can democratically impose your will on, on other people. I mean, uh, the whole Bill of Rights thing and, and all of that and limits on the power of government. So to what degree are you not just voting yourself into a welfare state, but are you coercing other people to be part of that welfare state and to support you in that? I mean, there are limits to how far we're willing to go in, in, in democracy in order to force other people to, to contribute in what to the degree that we want to be part, part of something. I just bought a copy of your book, What is Community? Community, to me, means people who actually help each other directly, like families, extended families, uh, associations. That is a real community. The word community is used, in, in Britain at least, the more it's used, the more it doesn't exist. Interesting. It's, it's just a lie. The, you know, community is, is, has been reduced and damaged by welfare states because they have basically taken the place of community. They have crowded out community. They have made it so instead of being your parents and your extended family looking after you, uh, and indeed in a mutual association like a friendly society existed in Britain, instead of that, you've got the state. You just go to the state and say, can I have some money? Can I have an apartment? Can I, you know, your relationship is you, your new new father and mother and extended family is the state. That's not a community. That's almost that's isolating. So, what inspired you to be here today to talk about this detriment? What I'm trying to do, the purpose of the latest book, The Welfare of Nations, is to find ways to make the government's interference in our lives better, so it does less damage while continuing to do the good that it's intended to do. So I'm, I'm trying to work, make the world a better place, basically, aren't we all? Yes, this is true. <laughs> what do you think is the most difficult piece of hosting an inclusive community event? The challenge is you don't know what anybody's going to say, and you don't know if you've got a good answer to it. Very true.